Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC Podcast. This is Dennis, and today I'm with my favorite ICU doc. How are you doing, Doug? I'm great, Dennis. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, today, I have a really uh, nerdy question for you. So the reason I got you on, Doug, is uh, this is, I think, a really, it could be a very in-depth question, and I know that uh, you're very used to that type of uh, material. Um, what I really need to know about is sodium bicarb, and specifically when it has to do with crush type syndromes, you know, metabolic acidosis type syndromes, um, because I think it's getting kind of overhyped or oversold as kind of like the miracle thing that's going to fix all of your problems. Uh, I think that's a misconception. I know that bicarbonate is in many different crush protocols, but it's also not in many different crush protocols. Uh, most specifically, the one we wrote for the prolonged field care working group. Um, the clinical practice guideline that we published a few years ago, where we kind of talked about uh, that, that there are, you know, some theoretical benefits to using bicarbonate, but none has has shown to be of clinical benefit in patients, uh, really in in any um, in any clinical trial. That all the benefits are are in the bench or uh, using lab animals, uh, which just aren't real world conditions. So, I mean, how, I guess, how would they really show benefit when you're giving them lots of fluids? I mean, there's lots of things going on to confound it. How would they show benefit? Right. Well, the two, the two big risks in rhabdomyolysis, which is, you know, can be traumatic. Uh, so rhabdomyolysis is the breakdown of skeletal muscle causing the release of myoglobin, which is a material contained in skeletal muscle uh, that can clog up the tubules in the kidney and cause basically like a hydrostatic renal failure. But, you know, uh, the, the tubules get, get plugged, um, fluid doesn't flow, and um, backs up and, um, and causes the kidney to fail. Uh, and the other big thing that we're worried about is the accumulation of toxic metabolites from inside the crushed cells or the destroyed cells. And the most concerning of those is potassium, which is a cardiotoxin. Um, so in high enough doses, potassium will cause a lethal arrhythmia, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, um, and can kill you uh, from from a cardiac arrest. So your endpoints with treating any rhabdomyolysis, uh, whether traumatic or caused by a heat injury or a drug overdose or malignant hyperthermia or diabetic ketoacidosis, the, the the cause of the rhabdomyolysis doesn't really matter. The endpoint is the same. You want to prevent kidney damage from the accumulation of myoglobin, and you want to reduce the risk of cardiac arrest from hyperkalemia, from high potassium. And really, the first, second, and third mechanism uh, or mechanism of therapy is um, to flush the tubules out with high rates of uh, intravenous fluid, classically um, normal saline, but in a in a you know austere environment, whatever IV fluid you have is fine. Um, to, and try to aim for a urine output of 200 cc's an hour minimum. Okay. I mean, it's going to take a hot minute to get that started, not to IV in the fluids, but to get the urine output that high. Um, I mean, how far, how early do you want to start this? Right away. Okay. If you suspect, if you suspect rhabdomyolysis from any, any source, you know, you see tea colored urine in a guy who's just on a three hour CrossFit workout, uh, it, you know, and dehydrated himself because he thought that was going to help him, you know, um, do the workout better and, and you know, um, get better results. If you see, um, you know, obvious crush, somebody's entrapped in a vehicle uh, for a long time and extricated. Somebody, you know, we see it in, in, in hospital medicine in patients who have cardiac arrests and are found at home after a period of immobility, which can be as short as, as an hour or two. Um, you know, just being down immobile on large muscle groups like the, the glutes and, and the thigh muscles is enough to cause rhabdo. As soon as you suspect it, start your fluids. You're, you're not really going to hurt them by starting too early, but you can, um, you know, potentially uh, increase their risk of either acute kidney injury or permanent kidney injury if you wait too long. You know, it's, uh, this is one of those where it's better to um, shoot first, aim later. I don't say that often. I don't say that often in medicine, but this is one of those ones where, where you know, you need to, um, you know, ready, fire, aim. Uh, because if, if you, you know, then do a dipstick and you don't see myoglobin, um, you know, the urine clears, uh, you can always stop it. But if you wait too long, the kidneys may just shut down and then you're in, then you're in a world of hurt. Right. Right. I think I would imagine it's probably a lot like, uh, you suspect, um, uh, herniation is starting with a TBI, severe TBI and you send right. your hypertonic. Right. Um, exactly. Right. Because one dose of hypertonic is not going to cause any, any serious side effects, if any side effect at all, 
uh, whereas delaying it, you know, could result in a catastrophic neurologic injury. One hundred percent correct. Yeah, perfect. So, you know, we we get this guy hooked up with IV fluids. We start sending it. Obviously, you have your calcium on standby. You know, you're mm -hmm. watching your monitors, and um, you know, we there's uh, you know, we talk about like the insulin and D fifty. We talk about the albuterol to hide the potassium, um, mm -hmm. but in, inevitably, you know, bicarbonate gets whipped out um, because I don't know. This is like the big boy drug when it comes to crush and uh, you know, we set it up, you know, they push the one amp, so 50 milli equivalents, and usually they look at me and I tell them, hey, your entitled CO2 goes up, and then, you know, a little while later, it's come back down, and nothing's really happened. Um, obviously, that's just a, a training scenario, but what if, if there was a thing that it was doing, I guess, what, how do we use it effectively or know who to use it effectively on? Because the idea that I'm going to really change his pH that much, I don't, I guess I don't believe it. Right. Well, first off, you know, most of the studies look at, at alkalinizing the urine to a specific pH, which you're going to you're going to need to measure. <clears throat> you know, I suppose with a dipstick, uh, we'll give you a range, uh, but you know, you're going to need to get the pH like six point five or so. Um, and if you're not objectively measuring it, then you really don't know how much bicarb to push, um, and you really don't know how frequently to measure. So it's it's fairly labor intensive. It's also fairly resource intensive because you're burning dipstick, uh, you know, test strips, and you know, you're burning your bicarb, um, which I, I'm sure you don't have an infinite supply of, and um, you know, and again, you know, for no proven benefit, you'd be you'd be better off um, focusing on your urine output and what you can do to increase that. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I believe like 90% of the potassium ends up coming through the urine anyway. Mm -hmm. So it makes yeah. a lot of sense to focus on urine output. Mm -hmm. If fluids alone are not doing it, mm -hmm. what else can I do safely? Well, you know, you're there's sort of two mechanisms of getting, of managing acute hyperkalemia, high potassium. You can drive it back into the cells uh, and the, um, the medicines that will do that will be insulin. Um, insulin causes potassium to be reabsorbed by the cells. However, you know, you have to give a, a decent dose of insulin, like 10 units of insulin, which in a normal non-diabetic person is probably going to make them profoundly hypoglycemic. So you give it with a D50. The D50 doesn't do anything therapeutically except keep you from crashing from, you know, hypoglycemia when you give yeah. the insulin. Uh, and then, um, Albuterol, but it's we really need a lot of albuterol. We typically talk about a twenty minute, <clears throat> excuse me, a twenty minute dose of nebulized albuterol, which is you know absorbed into the pulmonary capillary is probably a little bit better than um, meter dose inhaler albuterol. Right. Um, Can so you go talk meter dose inhalers? You know, every people usually quote puffs, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I haven't really found anything that's reliable to say this many puffs equals X number of milliliters um, right. of nebulized stuff. I mean, you're talking like one canister of it, or no, I mean, we're, we're giving, you know, three canisters of nebulized stuff. So I would think you would need that much MDI. The problem with the meter dose inhaler is most of it winds up in your mouth. Um, uh, even with this, you know, even with a spacer, which you're probably not going to have. Um, so I'm not sure I would even, I probably wouldn't even worry about giving it an MDI. You don't have that many of them, save them for the patients with respiratory problems who are really going to need them. I think the, the thing to consider carrying for crush, and we've talked about this since the CPG is written, is um, is one of the mechanisms. So, that, so that, that's the first mechanism, right? Is to drive it back into the cell. The second mechanism is to get rid of the potassium, right? To, to excrete it from the body, and that can be done in several ways. You can um, bind it up in the stool with um, a K exhalate and um, and poop it out, but that's going to take you know hours and hours, like six hours. You can um, the fastest way to do it is to um, increase potassium um, potassium filtration through the kidneys uh, using a loop diuretic. So, and Lasix, Lasix is the, you know, the loop diuretic you use. So, you know, if it were me and I, and we do this in the hospital all the time, you know, if we're treating acute hyperkalemia and trying to avoid putting somebody on, on dialysis, giving, giving them a chance of medical therapy, you know, part of the cocktail um, is going to be 40 milligrams of IV Lasix. And that's easy to carry. It's shelf stable. Uh, it is, it is you know, demonstrably lowers potassium, um, you know, and it'll increase your, the, you know, your urine output. It'll increase your urine flow, which is going to help your myoglobin level. Right. So, so that's I what guess, I would do. how bad of a patient would you be willing to use that on? Uh, you know, let's say we don't have labs. Um, so I would use that in the patient where I'm seeing PVCs or runs of VT on my on my telemetry. Um, if I have telemetry, um, hopefully I do. Or if I'm feeling PVCs or if the patient complains of palpitations. And that's a super important question to be asking the patient is like, you know, do you feel chest pain? Do you feel palpitations? Do you feel heart, your heart kind of racing in your chest? Um, and then, you know, feel their pulse, feel for PVCs. If, if you can have even a three lead, some sort of telemetry and be looking for, you know, increasing frequency of PVCs, short runs of VT, um, then that's the person I would, you know, give them uh, some calcium to stabilize um, their, their myocytes, their, their heart muscle cells and, and electrical conducting system and, um, and a loop diuretic. 
And then the third mechanism for removing it is something that's not readily available in, in long field care, which is to dialyze it out. Okay. So, um, well, I mean, you have peritoneal dialysis. Yep. If you can set up peritoneal dialysis, then that's what that would be. That would be your um, your last step for right. sure. If if you're um, if you're hyperkalemic, um, if you're hyperkalemic, you're getting PVCs, you're getting runs of VTAC, you're getting palpitations, you give Lasix. In that case, I would think you're probably in some sort of renal failure where your kidneys just aren't aren't responding to the fluid in the Lasix, and you're just not putting out enough urine. Right. You know, that makes sense. Either because either because you're too late initiating therapy, or your um, you know uh, initial insult was so great that uh, you know the kidneys didn't have a chance. Right. Um, that 40, that 40 milligrams of, uh, Lasix, how long would you expect that to last? Keeping that about high? Six hours. About six, about hours? six hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's definitely, that's going to be a lot of fluid you're putting in as well. Um, yeah. I would definitely probably suggest more than, more than one IV line, right? Yeah. Multiple, multiple source of access. Hopefully they're conscious enough to drink. Yep. Yeah. I mean, if they can, if they can drink, uh, it doesn't really matter how they're getting the fluid. What really matters is, is the flow through the kidneys. Um, you know, most, in most resuscitations, we talk about. You know, 30 to 50 cc's an hour or 0.5 cc's per kilogram, you know, is being an adequate urine output. This is, this is different. This isn't, you know, this isn't aimed at good enough yeah. or barely, barely good enough kidney performance. This is really, this is really aimed at hydrostatic pressure and flow um, to dislodge the myoglobin, which is very sticky. So you really need, you know, you need to turn your, your faucet on high to dislodge it. Otherwise, it's going to get stuck and, and, and come up your kidney and, 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 and worsen your renal failure. Right. Would you say, you know, let's say I'm in a situation, we have the crush patient we just talked about, he was throwing PVCs, and yep. I put the calcium on, we got fluids going, we have like multiple lines of access. Um, I push uh, the Lasix, so my urine output is, you know, 200 plus. Um, would it be safe, you know, and I have no lab, so I have no ability to find out what the potassium actually is. Mm -hmm. If Lasix lasts uh, roughly six hours, right, I start to see that urine output start to come yep. down, so I'm expecting, okay, the Lasix is coming off, but I'm not finding any um, arrhythmias of any kind, like the PVCs have stopped, you know, the runs of VTAC have stopped, et cetera, et cetera. Would I be safe to stop with the Lasix and just continue fluids until, you know, I don't know, I have some other indicator that I can go ahead and stop with this as well? Yeah, I, absolutely. And um, you want to be cautious with the Lasix. Obviously, don't shy away from it if you think it's indicated. But if it's not indicated, then then I would then you're right. I would stop because, um, you know, hypokalemia, low potassium, you know, can also trigger serious arrhythmias. So, you know, you want that potassium in a sweet spot between three and four, you know, um, mill equivalents per liter. Um, and you're not going to be able to measure that. So, you know, over six, less than less than 2.5, you know, you're going to be in trouble. So you're just going to have to dial it into your clinical um, clinical signs. And if those are gone, I wouldn't redose it. I'd wait till they come back. And chances are probably pretty low that they are coming back because, um, you know, you're going to clear the potassium from rhabdomyolysis faster than you'll clear the myoglobin. Oh, okay. Perfect. And then you start yeah, seeing your that urine output clear up, and then you can probably start dialing back, I would imagine. Yeah, you know, your, your creatinine phosphokinase, which is another lab that we measure in rhabdomyolysis, that's going to continue to rise, you know, potentially for, you know, half a day or a day. Um, but once once you get good urine output, um, your potassium levels what, your potassium levels should fall after you've initially treated them, okay. unless, you, unless you go into renal failure, unless, unless, you're, unless you can't ensure that urine output. Right. Right. Definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, so what about... Because one of the things they talk about with sodium bicarb is by alkalinizing the urine, which we may or may not be able to do. You mm -hmm. are preventing the cast formation, and you're preventing that uh, acute kidney injury from happening. Um, I mean, is that is that a real effect, or is that just theoretical? Well, it may be an effect, but by by alkalinizing your urine, um, you know, in the in the human trials that have been done, none of which are great quality, like lots of case series and retrospective analysis, very few, like you know, randomized placebo controlled trials, uh, if any. Um, you know, there's never been, there's really no difference in the bicarbonate arm and the IV fluids alone arm in terms of progression to acute kidney injury. There's one paper um, that showed a difference and every, everybody else was, was um, no difference. So, um, like I said, so it, it may actually do that, but whether it's clinically significant is, is probably, probably is not. Right. So I remember, I think the study that I sent you, it said to alkalinize above, I think it was like 6.3 or 6.5, something like that. Yeah. Like that's still really bad. Like that's right. very acidotic. Um, right. Well, urine's always more acidotic than blood. Right. So, uh, so there is that. But yeah, that's very, very true. Um, I don't know. To be honest, without without crush um, and an improvised, I guess uh, 
hypertonic for severe TBI, like why would we carry it? Uh, by, well, bicarb? Like said, yeah, bicarb, yeah, bicarb will make you um, a, a um, improvised hypertonic solution, which is great. Um, and, and, and like I said, the rate, the main reason I think to, to manipulate anybody's pH is if you have a metabolic acidosis that's causing clinical harm, right? Your heart, your heart isn't squeezing as well. Uh, your blood vessels aren't squeezing as well. Uh, and your, your coagulopathic, uh, and, or your, um, your, you're so acidotic that you're resistant to catecholamine pressors and shock. So, you know, and I think we talked about it in, we may have talked about it in the lab podcast we did, but, you know, the pH of less than 7.25 you're going to become coagulopathic. Your, your clotting factors are losing 30% of their effectiveness and below seven, and it goes quick from there. Below 7.2, it's like 50%. Um, at a pH below 7.15, you're resistant to the pressor effects of epinephrine, norepinephrine, and phenylephrine. So the only things that will work would be vasopressin and then some exotic pressors that you know, you're not going to have access to. Um, and at a, P, a pH you know, in the seven ones and below, your cardiac uh, output your your cardiac contractility is going to go down um, as well as your vascular tone so you'll get a, a, vas a vasodilatory shock and a cardiogenic shock just because of low cardiac output so in those extreme situations you know correcting correcting ph to a, 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 or correcting acidosis to a ph of 7.25 is is not a bad thing in the setting of somebody who's either coagulopathic or in in um in shock that's especially shock that's resistant to pressors you know you're you're having to dial up your epinephrine you're having to add a second presser you're having to add a third presser that then and you really need to think about normalizing the ph okay not normalizing it um improving your ph right. increasing it um how much like how much movement can i get i mean obviously it varies um but with that with an amp of bicarb in an adult sized uh human being like how much movement of the ph can i get out of that one amp let me think and give you the simple answer first and then i'll give you the complex answer um the simple answer is you're going to get probably hundredths maybe three or four hundredths and I'm, i this is like totally anecdotal I, you know if somebody looks it up and says hey you're wrong i'd be happy to admit that i'm wrong but i generally think of if i've got a ph of 7.1 i'll normally give three amps of bicarb to get to a ph of 7.25 7.27 um so maybe that's what 0 0.5 0 0.05 uh of an increase per amp now that is in a person so that's the simple answer um, that's a simple answer. Uh, the complex answer is it varies. You could give an amp and it could come up quite a bit more and generally not. I think 105 is probably more right. Um, the more, the, the bigger, the, the bigger likelihood is a worse situation where they are in decompensated shock that is progressing to irreversible shock and their acidosis is a sign of that. Um, and in those patients, you pour bicarbonate into them and there's no change. You know, you put in a dozen amps right? and i've and we've done this you know over the course of a three hour two or three hour or more resuscitation you put in a dozen amps or more and their ph either goes sideways or gets even worse that is and, and that's because they uh, are their their shock is is progressing from decompensated to irreversible um either because of the dose of the shock the, the magnitude of the initial insult the amount of blood loss how much heart muscle was damaged in their heart attack um how bad their sepsis is you know um or because of a delay in presentation or a delay in the onset of treatment that the, the shock train just got on the rails and gathered so much speed that you can't, you can't slow it down. Right. No, that definitely makes a lot of sense. I mean, um, obviously it's gonna be difficult for us to monitor that in the field, uh, <laughs> maybe in a clinic, maybe, you know, you get a nice bath and you happen to be the one who's got yours updated and you have the cartridges and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, am I using like an insulin syringe to get this or do I need like a case of it to do anything? You know what I mean? Right. But, um, I would imagine in that situation, like you're talking about, he's not responding to blood. He's not responding to calcium. They're not, you know, he's not responding how they normally should. Maybe it's worth throwing some bicarb at him. Yeah, yeah, um, you know, exactly right. Uh, they're not. They, you can't get them warm. You know, there are other signs of a patient who's who's in severely decompensated shock, bordering on irreversible, or frankly, irreversible shock. Um, and, and you know, the definition of irreversible shock is. They don't get better no matter what you do, mm -hmm. or they continue, or they continue to get worse no matter what you do. And you've got all sorts of clinical markers for them not getting better. You know, their blood pressure goes down no matter how much blood you put in. Their temperature gets colder no matter how much you try to warm them. You know, pH is just one thing, but you know, you don't need you don't need pH to know that your your patient is is not responding to aggressive therapy. Right, and I mean the risk I think I would I'm guessing is really small, right, compared to death. 
you know, right. all the alkalosis doesn't seem so bad, you know? Yeah. Now, if you have that patient, and I realize we've kind of gone down a little bit of a tangent here, but, but hopefully our listeners will indulge us. If you have that patient who is, you really suspect is progressing toward um, irreversible shock, don't give them a, you know, don't give them a homeopathic dose of Vicar. Don't give them one amp. Give them three. Give them three. Um, again, you're not, you're not going to harm them with alkalosis. Um, you're not going to harm them with with the respiratory acidosis when it breaks down the carbon dioxide. You give them 10 amps, you'll cause a respiratory acidosis that may have some clinical significance. You give them three, they won't, but three is a reasonable test dose. And if they get better, you're like, oh, hmm. well, maybe they have an acidosis and maybe they are irreversible. Maybe they are responsive to therapy. So, you know, maybe I should continue doing that. So you can also make a bicarbonate infusion. You can put three amps of bicarb in a liter of saline. Um, once you've given their three bolus doses, you can do that and run it at 25 or 50 um, cc an hour. Just trying to have kind of like a background um, of uh, uh, background treatment. So again, we are way off topic for crush. This is talk we're talking about metabolic acidosis and shock. Um, um, but you know, to, to circle back around and talk about crush is like your your job is to get enough saline into them that you it, it, plus or minus a diuretic that you can um, get two to three hundred cc's an hour of urine output through the kidneys. And if you can't do that, then you need to think about some sort of dialysis potentially. Well, um, really, all I was looking for is just a real in-depth explanation, sodium bicarb. Obviously, we were talking smack about it before, but there are definitely places for it. So let's save our what little supply we have for those instances that it may actually work. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Dennis, always a pleasure. And uh, looking forward to uh, the next the next conversation, the next topic that uh, you or the listeners come up with. Happy to help anytime. I appreciate it. I'll dream something up. Okay, have a good one, bud. That's it for today's podcast. Be sure to go to our website, www.prolongfieldcare.org. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Subscribe and stay on the bleeding edge of combat medicine. This is Dennis for the PFC Podcast. Our boy is waiting there for you.